All right. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the sixth week of our Crop Hour webinar series. Um, for anyone new here, my name is Shelby Pritchard. I'm the IPM specialist here at SDSU, as well as the moderator for the series. Um, once again, appreciate you taking um, time out of your morning to be here with us. A um, few quick reminders. We will have a short poll up after each speaker today. Just a couple of questions. Um, we really appreciate the feedback. And also after each speaker, we will have a CCA credit available and we'll make sure we keep it up there for you. Um, and then feel free to ask as many questions as you want throughout the presentation. Um, our first speaker today is Sarah Botter. She is our Extension Agronomy Field Specialist um, for SDSU Extension. Um, she has been here since August of 2016. She primarily focuses on general agronomy, cover crops and forages. And much of her time is spent working with producers, speaking at or hosting SDSU extension events and writing extension articles. Um, and today, Sarah is going to be talking about South Dakota Forage Research Update. I think you're on mute still, Sarah. There we go. There you go. It's hiding the button from me. Sorry about that. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks for the intro, Shelby. And you can see the right version of my slides, correct? Yes. Okay. So uh, without further ado, I think I'll just move ahead. Today, I'm going to discuss some of the forage research that's been going on in South Dakota. Most of the research I'll discuss um, is new, but I do have, I'm going to start with some older information just because I think it's pertinent and we don't get a lot of opportunities to share forage research with you. So um, if there's data, whether it's new or old, as long as it's pertinent, I like to share it because I think uh, a lot of people find interest in it. So. Um, like I said, some of this is going to be from this year, and some of it will be uh, from previous years. So one thing I like to remind audiences is that we really overlook forages in South Dakota. Um, forage research in South Dakota in the past has primarily consisted of variety trials, and that was great data. Um, we lost those for a while just due to funding and the way that hires and programming work. Um, but we are able to, we were able to get those going again a few years ago, in addition with a lot of other forage research. South Dakota is actually number four in alfalfa production in the United States as of the 2017 uh, USDA NAS census. And now they do the census, I think about every four years. So there'll be a new one uh, very soon coming out. But I just always thought that's really interesting. We kind of overlook the fact that we grow so much alfalfa. So there was one and a half million acres harvested in 2017 alone. Um, and, you know, forage research is not just about alfalfa. We do a lot of other things, uh, one of them being grazing trials. Now, a lot of the research I'm going to discuss today took place at the Southeast Research Farm near Beersford because that's the projects that I've been able to get involved with. There is other research going on across the state. I know at Dakota Lakes near Pier, there's a lot of research going on there. There's also research going on um, near Sturgis at the West River Research Farm and many different places in between. So, excuse me, don't get me wrong, there is research going on on forages across our state, but today I'm focusing on those trials that I've been involved with. And just because they've happened near Beersford doesn't mean that some of these aren't applicable to anyone anywhere in the Midwest, really. So we've done some grazing trials, and I know there's grazing trials going on all over our research farms across the state. Um, there is an alfalfa variety trial. This will be the second year, or excuse me, the second round that we've been able to do this. So this is the second year of our second study. It's a three-year variety trial. Um, so this one will end this coming growing season, will be our third year of data collection on it. And it is based on paid entries. So commercial companies put in paid entries and we just take as many as we can fit. Um, so then we also do some warm and cool season forage work. Ever since 2018, we've been focusing on annual warm and cool season trials. And there's a lot more coming. Um, currently, there's work on and off going on on salt tolerant lines, salt tolerant forages, alfalfas, grasses. Um, I'm doing some work on arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi um, in alfalfa and also alfalfa seeding rates um, and inoculants. I have some data on that. Um, no data yet, those were seeded last year. 
and because of the growing season, we just weren't able to collect anything. So I'm looking forward to getting some data off those in the coming years. So this is a grazing trial that took place near Beersford and it's older data. Like I mentioned, this is actually a 2014 study, but I think the data is really great to show audiences. It's showing the effect on the following crop yield. So the, uh, what happened was there was corn seeded, it was harvested as a cash crop, and then rye was planted. So a bit of a double cropping year. And then following the rye, soybean was put in. So in the interim, they grazed that rye that went in between the corn and soybeans. Um, it was, I believe it was a group of heifers, if I remember right. And it was fall and spring grazed in some areas. And then in other areas, they only grazed it in the spring. And then of course there was a check where nothing was grazed. And basically the point of this data is that if you look at the statistics at the bottom, the NS means not significant. And it's at a 0 0.05 level. So this means that in that second column where we're looking at soybean yield, whether it was grazed in the fall and the spring, grazed just in the spring or not grazed at all, there was no significant difference. And we're 95% sure of that, that there was no outlying factor causing that data to show up other than what we were trying to do. Um, so what this is telling us is that grazing didn't hurt the soybeans at all. In fact, if statistically speaking, the numbers are the same, but if you look at them, there's even actually a lower yield in the ungrazed portion, um, but we really treat those the same. There was a slight difference in test weight statistically, but otherwise everything was pretty much the same across the board. So we've found this in other trials as well with effect on corn and soybeans both. And as long as you're not taking away from moisture or soil fertility, we tend to see this as a result. Um, if you're grazing in like a 2019, that might be an outlier because if it's so wet and you're gaining just a ton of compaction, then you know we might see some problems. But generally speaking, we're not seeing significant differences due to grazing. So that's kind of neat. If you have livestock or your neighbor does and you can incorporate this, it's a bit of double cropping that's possible in a state where we don't get a lot of cropping season. So kind of neat. Um, this is another little bit older study, but I think the data is so uh, neat and kind of fun to share. So there's two cover crop blends, and what the research firm was looking at was average daily gain um, and the com comparative effect on yield of the following crop after these cover crops. So these were planted on oat and rye stubble. So um, two treatments. And then each treatment was planted on oat stubble and each treatment was planted on rye stubble. Um, there's a low residue blend in that top row and a high residue blend in the bottom row. And if you look closely, the big differences are that low residue blend has a lot of brassicas in it, um, radish, pea, and lentil specifically. And then the higher residue blend has a lot of sorghum sedan grass and oat. And that's what changes our seeding rate and makes these blends a little different. And generally speaking, we see that grass blends can be a little higher quality, um, but broadleaf blends, excuse me, sometimes broadleaf blends can be comparatively higher quality, but grass blends tend to have more tonnage in them. So looking at average daily gain, um, where it says rye and oat down there across the X axis, that's the stubble it was planted on. So broadleaf, cover crop mixture, we can see we didn't have as high of an average daily gain as we did with the grass. And we would expect that simply because grass has decent quality, but also has typically a lot of tonnage. Um, but also you can see what's interesting is the red and the yellow bar where we've got grass and a broadleaf blend, but they're on the oat stubble. And the cover crops planted on oat stubble tended to do a little bit better um, and give us a little bit better average daily gain of these calves than the cover crops on the rye stubble. And there's a few things we might be able to take from that. I think in this case, it could be um, a moisture or even some soil nitrogen, depending on the treatment, um, whether the rye took away more nutrients or just perhaps more moisture. So kind of interesting to see how average daily gain turned out here. And then the last thing looked at in this study was corn yield. So the following corn yield after this cover crop was taken out and grazed. And again, looking in the middle of this chart, you can see that grazing or not grazing, there was no significant difference. Um, very minimal yield difference there anyway, but it was found to be not significant. So grazing did not hurt the corn crop at all. And looking on the left, 
here, um, you've got 75% broadleaf blend, right? And we had a 75% grass blend. The broadleaf blend, although average daily gain was lower, the corn yield was actually a little bit higher and it was significant. That's what that star means, about 15 bushel difference. So in this case, we gave up some average daily gain to get higher corn yield. So it kind of depends on what your goals are. A little bit of give and take here. And then um, looking all the way on the right, what we would definitely expect with adding nitrogen to this trial, 160 pounds of N was added to half of each treatment. And you can see that there was a pretty big, um, looks like maybe a 45 bushel, I believe it was, yield hike where we added nitrogen. And this is kind of an interesting thing. Um, of course, with corn, adding nitrogen is gonna make a big difference. And so we can assume that our cover crops, the legumes that were in there weren't breaking down fast enough or weren't enough you know, to provide the nitrogen that we needed for this following corn crop. Um, but it is kind of intriguing to think about nitrogen on cover crops. And there are some studies going on on that. We know that nitrogen can help along a cover crop, especially grass crops in a lot of cases, but how much and what's worth the investment is really the question that we have to think about and that we're researching. So that's an older study, but I always think this data is really interesting and meaningful. So looking at some new data, this is, um, what I'm gonna move into here is alfalfa variety trials. So the variety trial that we have going on right now, like I mentioned earlier, we're in the second year of a three-year trial. This coming growing season will be the third year. I'm gonna show you the first two years of data. These are randomized replicated trials. Um, the harvest area is four by 25 feet and that fits our harvesting equipment and is pretty standard for alfalfa variety trials across the US. There aren't a lot of these going on anymore. They used to be very popular and just because of funding and the way universities these higher faculty in different areas. Um, there's just not a lot of variety trials anymore. So we're pretty glad and proud to be able to continue to do this. Um, we harvest them in about four week intervals. It's not always perfect because of course it depends on the weather just like any farmer would, but we shoot for four week intervals. That's standard practice in alfalfa research world. And then some of the plots this past year, and this is typical field research, um, we had some skip row issues when they were planted. So we, of course, had to calculate that into the yield so that the yields are fair. Um, but we had a drill row plug and with alfalfa, as if you've ever seeded alfalfa, it's pretty hard to know. Um, so I'm just totally transparent here. We did have some skip rows, but we measured and, and calculated them in. So this is the variety trial data from last year. So you can see this was the first year of the study. So we only had two cuttings, which is pretty typical of a first year alfalfa stand. And what's easiest to look at, I think here is the season total. So the dry matter tons per acre is there on the right-hand side, the last column. And the numbers that are bolded are significantly higher yielding. So they're kind of all in one bracket, we would say, um, those are the significantly highest yielding across the two cuttings for that year. And some of these are experimental lines. Um, some you can see the actual name. I believe a um, couple of them are abbreviations just to make them fit on the column. But this full data is in the Southeast Research Farm report from both last year and this year. So you can find that. Um, but it's, it's really, interesting to look at this, but I always encourage people that you want to look at all three years of the data. Um, it's fun to see what does best the first year and the second year, and then the third year, and some people really want to see that. But I don't like making assumptions on this until we see all years if we're looking at overall yield. Um, but you might recognize some of the lines that did well. Others are experimental lines, and they're intentionally left as numbers. I don't know what they are any more than, than you do. You can see that the check is in there. Um, the check is actually vernal. And I just want to point out that um, vernal tends to be competitive or most of the old check lines, they tend to be competitive yield wise, but they're lacking in a lot of um, longevity is one thing, getting them to not burn out after one or two seasons, and also quality. Now this study, and this is typical of variety trials, doesn't show a lot of quality data because it gets expensive for the companies. Um, but if we were to do a quality study, I think you would see some differences there. So I just want to point that out. And here is this year's data, maybe. There we go. Sometimes it doesn't want to advance slides. So um, this year, this past season, we had three cuttings and you can see the dates there at the top, tried to get them evenly spaced. 
Um, and the, again, the bolded numbers are the significantly highest yielders based on season total. So that's why within the individual cuttings, you might see them spread out a bit. And once in a while, one doesn't do well on a certain cutting. Um, but for the most part, you can see, especially that third cutting and season total are pretty similar in uh, the ranking that we would give them. And you can see that the highest yielding fraction goes all the way from 4.8 to 4.1. So there's a, a bit of a spread there, um, but honestly, we really were impressed with these lines. You'll recognize a lot of them did, did well both last year and this past growing season. Um, so it'll be fun to see what happens um, in the third year. And again, I pointed out the check last time. You can see this time the check didn't do near as well um, because a lot of those older lines tend to kind of burn out as time goes on. So just some interesting data. It'll be exciting to see what our third year holds. And all of this data is in the Southeast Research Farm Report and it's um, more thoroughly explained there as well because I think it's hard to look at these numbers in a PowerPoint like this. So I just want to go over rye a little bit. We've done some rye research and uh, rye is a really interesting cat. If you're not familiar with it, I always take a second to just go over some of the general agronomics of rye to make sure that we're all on the same page. So highlights of rye, the big ones that people like are that it's competitive with weeds. Um, it requires moderate fertility versus some of our grass crops really need a lot of fertility requirements. And it's dual purpose, like a lot of small grains. So it can be used for forage or grain. Uh, that's what I always say about small grains. The nice thing is if they fail as a grain crop, there's still something you can use them for quite easily. Um, it's a cool season crop and a lot of people like that because it's off with our warm season crop rotation timing in Eastern South Dakota. However, in Western South Dakota, that might be a negative. It might just be one more cool season crop that you're trying to get in. So it depends on who you ask. Um, it improves soil health and structure typically with its roots, and it's very winter hardy. You'll hear people say that rye is so tough, and it is. It's tough, but there are some disadvantages. Um, it doesn't handle wet feet very well. So any wet conditions, especially when you're putting it in, can be tough to get it to establish. And it doesn't handle high temperatures well because it is a cool season crop. So it's sensitive to, you know, very hot times, but, you know, drought isn't as much. Of course, it needs water to grow, but it's fairly drought hardy compared to other species. It's just that when it gets very hot, it's hard for it to do well because it is a cool season crop. And then contamination of wheat. So I mentioned out west, you know, if you're growing wheat, you're likely not growing rye. We always recommend people not grow wheat and rye in the same farm because they're contaminants and it's very difficult to clean rye out of wheat, basically impossible. So you don't want to do that. So for a dry in specific, uh, one of the reasons rye can be so popular as a cover is people like to use it for forage. It's got fantastic biomass production potential. And you can see there, um, we've had anywhere at the Southeast farm from 1,580 to 4,700 pounds of dry matter per acre harvested in rye biomass production. On average, a lot of studies say two to 3,000 pounds is probably the average you're gonna see. Um, it has a nice fall planting date. It does need some moisture, so it's very moisture dependent, especially when we're talking about forage. You know, excuse me, plants are, are smart, and if we're trying to get a grain head on, sometimes they'll be shorter in order to, you know, that vegetative state is going to get cut a little bit in order to try to put grain on. But when we're looking at forage rye, if we can get that moisture going, you know, we get the height and we get the leaves that we're looking for and we cut it before that grain is mature anyway. Um, so moisture is really important with any forage crop. And then of course, burn down timing, that also comes back to moisture. If we let it go too long in the spring, one of the drawbacks is it's, if it's a dry year, it's going to dry out your soils even more, which can be a big problem. Um, if we don't get it burned down soon enough. And also it can cause um, a lot of your soil fertility to get used up in your cover crop when you meant it for the following crop. So we just have to watch the timing in the spring of the burn down. So there was a rye grain variety trial done the last few years, but I'm gonna share with you um, one that happened last year at Beersford. Also we did different variety trials across the area here. These are all kind of Southeastern um, towns, but it just gives you an idea of how rye does in different growing environments, you know, different locations. And it was a relatively dry year. So keep that in mind. 
And what you can see, again, the bolded numbers are significantly higher yielding. And if you look at the average yield across all of these sites, so we've got one, two, three, four, five locations, and two of those, uh, six total, two of them were at Beersford, excuse me. So six locations, two of which were Beersford at the research farm. And basically what I take from this slide is that we can see that the lines that are doing well in this study are hybrid lines for the most part. So hybrid rye really did well um, across sites, average yielding when we're looking at grain yield. It, and we did a little math, it was worth the investment. The extra we paid for seed was worth the investment in, in the end with the yield that we received based on the price of rye. Now, of course, that's all dependent on seed cost and uh, what rye grain is going for, but this year it was definitely worth it. So the hybrid lines were worth the investment versus the open pollinated lines because they had better yields across the board. Now, when we look at forage rye specifically, and again, all this data is in the Southeast Farm Report. So if you want more information on this, you can certainly find it. And I'll give you that at the end of the talk here. So forage rye, again, we're looking at biomass production. There's great variability, um, but typically as a cover crop, if you're looking at it as a crop of crop, two to 3,000 pounds per acre is pretty standard. And I think that's what most folks are probably interested in. Um, it depends on the fall planting date and moisture. And again, spring burn down. So with forage, as you might expect, the later the burn down is, the more biomass we're gonna get, but we don't want it to get too mature, but the more nutrients that rye is gonna take up. So it's all how you look at it. The forage rye variety trial, if you look at the dry weight column, it's showing us that it might not be worth the investment in hybrid rye. Um, a lot of these, like Ryman, for example, that's an open pollinated, or excuse me, yes, that's an open pollinated line. So the open pollinated lines did just as well or better than the hybrid lines in the forage trial. And you can see that when you look at the silage uh, tons per acre as well at the silage yield. Uh, we didn't run stats on the silage yields, but just looking at it with the naked eye, it's relatively obvious. It's pretty correlated well with the dry weight. So um, forage rye, open pollinated, did better or just as well as the extra expense you would put into hybrid rye. And these trials have been done the last few years, and we've seen very similar results every year. Um, I'm not sure if they will continue to do them, but I would say yes, since this research has been very popular and rye is gaining popularity in South Dakota. So in summary on the rye, it's tough, it's winter hardy and competitive, um, good yield potential from hybrid rye with a developing feed market means it could be profitable in the future in this area. Right now, if you're growing rye, you're either finding a use for it yourself, most likely, or you found a market before you plant it if you're using it as a cash crop. That's really the only safe way to use it um, because the feed market is kind of where it's at and you can't always find a market for it if you just plant it as you would corn and plan on marketing later. Um, for forage production, open pollinated lines seem to work adequately from the research that we've seen. Um, and of course, don't grow wheat and rye in the same for farm. Um, that's a contaminant issue. So moving on to a little bit more research that I've been a part of um, in 2019. So this is a couple years old, but I haven't gotten a chance to really spread this data. So I get every, every time I get a chance, I try to share it we did a bale storage demonstration. And this is not like brand new rocket science by any means, but it's something that hadn't been done in South Dakota um, or hadn't been done in a very long time. And I think it's something that's really widely overlooked is how we store our forages, whether that's bales or silage or any kind of forage. So what we did was we bought a load of hay, net wrapped hay, um, had it delivered on February 1st to the research farm. We core sampled it for quality analysis and weighed every bale and then stack them in different formations outside, as you typically would see most uh, beef cattle farms anyway do. Uh, not under roof, we did put one bale under roof as a control, I believe two as a control, but everything else was stacked outside. So July 25th, we moisture probed the bales, uh, weighed them again, and core sampled them. And this moisture probe was something we borrowed from University of Wisconsin from Dr. Kevin Shinners, who helped us set up this study. And it was really neat, a really neat piece of equipment that gave us, gave us moisture maps. But we had to probe every bale, I think it was 50 times. So, I mean, this, this took a long time. <laughs> the one thing about 2019, I'm guessing you haven't forgotten, is it rained 20 inches there at the farm from February 1st to July 31st when these bales were sitting out. 
So what that did for us was actually provide a really neat accelerated picture of what bale storage looks like, because typically we wouldn't have that much rain in that short of period of time. But a lot of producers are leaving hay out much longer than our study period was. So um, we wanted this data for a field day, so we didn't leave them out as long as we could have. But that rain really accelerated the results and kind of showed us what happens over time. Thankfully, the week previous to our final sampling in July was somewhat dry, so we got some reasonable results that shouldn't have been terribly affected by a recent rain. So um, I will mention there was one bale under roof as a check and it was basically as dry as could be minus just a, a small layer on the bottom. Um, and I should have put that picture in here, but it was just slightly wet because it was on in a hoop building that didn't have a cement floor, so we would expect a little wicking. Um, so next, the next one after the check, we just had a couple bales outside on their own so that they had full air expo exposure. The flat face was facing north and south and no air restriction. About 15% of the sampled area was greater than 22% moisture. So there was still some moisture in the bale, but you can see here the redder or oranger the bale is, the drier, the bluer, the wetter. You can see in this moisture map, um, you know, it wicked some up from the ground basically, and the east side was a little wet, which we would expect less sunlight or less warm temperatures mixed with sunlight on the east, of course. So now looking at our next formation, we had some road bales butted tightly together. So the rows were separated, but the bales were butted, and we saw storage losses due to water movement between those bales. Um, over half, 66% of the bales were more than 22% moisture. And we really wanna see these bales at least under 20% if we can help it. So there are some pros and cons of butting them together. Um, and experts actually don't agree on this. There are people that study this type of thing uh, in ag engineering, and they can't really agree whether the, fat, the flat faces, excuse me, should be butted together or should be left a few inches apart. Um, if left apart, what are you gonna catch? snow, right? Um, if they're butted together, the moisture and precipitation gets in there and then, you know, they're wicking off of each other and staying wet. So it's kind of a catch-22. And in this case, you can see the east side was wetter. Um, the, the diagram on the top right, there's a red bale there. That's the bale we probed. So you can kind of see as I go through here, which bales were probed. So you can see that, that it was wetter on the east side. And of course, that flat face picked up moisture from the bales around it. So this is the same, except we butted the rows together. So they're, the flat faces are butted and the rows are butted together in kind of a pod. And what happens here is the water runs down the gutter between the touching bales, between the rows. And the sunlight just can't get to the bottom quarter of the bale, sometimes even the bottom half. So more than 20% of the bale was greater than 30% moisture. So these did get quite wet. And you can see the bills that were sampled from the diagram here. Um, the east side again is wetter because of the sun coming up, temperature being cooler, but where the bales are touching is the obvious point. This is why we want your rows to be um, a couple feet apart. I believe three feet is the recommendation. I'll show you here at the end because they really do get moisture trapped in between them. And then mushroom stacking. I know a lot of people like to mushroom stack um, for windbreaks. And that's one thing if you're willing to sacrifice a little hay storage for that. But if you're just stacking, we really recommend you get away from this because it the bottom bale is just really poorly conserved. The top bale does great. In, in our case, it was very dry. But the bottom bale, 45% of the bale was greater than 35% moisture. Basically, that's a fancy way of saying it was really wet. So you can see in this diagram, the bottom bale is just soaking basically because every time it rains on that top bale, it runs around the bale and goes directly into the layers of the bottom bale. So we wanna avoid that if we can um, at all costs. This bale, when you touched it, mold just came flying out of it. So um, it's just not a good storage technique if you can help finding another way to do that. And then lastly, we did a pyramid. Um, pyramids are fairly common. And I've seen a lot of pyramid stacking in both Eastern and Western South Dakota. And I'm sure there's various reasons for it. Um, but we found a lot of water infiltration through the pile of pyramid stacking that wasn't covered. Uh, the lower bales, they don't get a lot of air. And of course, they get all the moisture from the top bales running down. Um, the bottom bales, especially on the east side, um, over 35% of the bales were greater than 30% moisture. So they were wet. And the lower bales really lost their integrity. Keep this picture in your mind here. I'll show you the moisture map. 
So you can see that where the bales are touching, especially on the east side and that bottom row really got it bad. Um, this is the north side of the pyramid. The bale on top that we tied them together with did fine, um, but everything else was quite wet. And this is what it looked like at the end. Those bales were wet, they really squatted. So it went from this, this. <laughs> So this is why it's so important um, to really watch your bale storage techniques. And, and I know people do things for various reasons, but we really wanna see you succeed and, and see your haze, you know, stay as nice as it was the day you baled it. So if you are storing your bales outdoors, um, avoid shaded areas in your tree belts and buildings. I think that gets overlooked a lot. Um, place your bales in rows oriented north to south, if you can help it, with three or four feet between the rows. So you're not getting that gutter effect. That helps sunlight dry the bales after it rains or snows. And then again, can't tell you whether you should butt your bales together or leave a foot to a foot and a half um, of the flat faces apart. Totally up to you. People really can't agree on that. If you can, use a slight south-facing slope with a well-drained soil surface that can really help get the water off there. You know, net wrapping, a lot of people are net wrapping these days. That really helps hold the shape of the bale. And if you do need to make stacks, try to cover them. So this is just, um, I'm running out of time, but this is just an effective hay storage um, based on loss ranges. This isn't my data, it's from the University of Wisconsin, but it kind of shows you that the ranges can really be vast and wide. The worst here is of course uncovered on the ground, um, followed by covered on the ground and uncovered on a rock pad, but just kind of something interesting to look at for storage loss. Of course, under roof is your best option. And then the last thing I just want to mention is that we don't have the data yet. We're currently analyzing it, but uh, Ben Beckman with the University of Nebraska, Kieran and Brandt with SDSU Extension and myself worked on a corn silage by chop length and packing density study this last year. Um, there is a lot of corn silage harvested in South Dakota. Uh, in 2020, there was 360,000 acres, which yielded over 6.4 mil million tons. Uh, of yield. So we put up a lot of corn silage. And so in this study, we were looking at quality losses based on chop length and packing density, and then the interaction between the two. And so we made mini silos out of sewage pipe. That's what that blue pipe is there. That pipe was, they were three feet long and eight inches outside diameter with a quarter inch wall. Um, we packed them at the end of August, 61% moisture silage. And then we dumped them and sampled them mid-December. We did find a heated shop, so it was worth it. <laughs> and the analysis is currently in process, but I want you just to, to watch for it if you're interested. We'll get this printed and out there as soon as we can get the everything summarized and analyzed. But we had nine treatments. We took the three chop lengths, quarter inch, half inch, and three quarter inch. So kind of a short, a long, and a medium. And then we um, intermixed them with three different packing densities. 12 pounds of dry matter per cubic foot, 15 and 17. We were shooting for 12, 15 and 18 and couldn't achieve 18. Um, the skid steer with the plunger would come up off the ground. So it's pretty hard to achieve ideal packing density. I think most people are at that 15. Um, we don't really wanna see 12, but I think we have a lot of piles that are probably packed at 12. So that's why we're doing the study to show why it's important. And this is, we did some demos so you can kind of see with these tubes, the left is the quarter inch, the three in the middle are the half and the right is the three quarter inch chop length. So each one of those left to right within the three is the lighter to the heavier packing density. It's a little hard to see in this picture, but it was fun to do the study, a lot of work, but I think the data is gonna be um, telling. There's data out there showing this information, but we wanted to do something local to South Dakota and, and timely. So hopefully we can share that with you soon. Um, so again, I mentioned it a couple times, if you want more information on any of the data I talked about today, check out the progress report from the annual um, research farm report. You can just Google South Dakota Southeast Research Farm and you will get to the Ag Experiment page and then you can look at all of the research reports back a long ways, they're all there. So do check that out. I'm out of time. So this is my contact and thank you for listening. I'll turn it over to Shelby. All right, thank you so much, Sarah. And I will go ahead and share my screen.
All right, and we'll leave that up and there should be a poll up here. And while that is up, I'm just gonna go ahead and introduce our second speaker of the day. Um, that is Patrick Wagner. He is our entomology field specialist for SDSU University um, Extension. Um, his office is based out of Rapid City, South Dakota, uh, where his work focus, focuses primarily on agricultural um, in the Western half of the state. Um, Patrick got his bachelor's in insect science from Iowa State University and then his master's in entomology from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. And with that, um, today his title is gonna be Blister Beetles in Alfalfa, What to Expect in 2022. And with that, I will go ahead and stop sharing my screen and take it away, Patrick. Okay, can you see my slides all right? I can see your slides. Perfect. Okay, well, uh, good day, everyone. Um, today I'm going to be talking about blister beetles. Uh, it's a topic that got some attention certainly last year. We saw quite a few of these uh, showing up across the state in alfalfa fields. Um, so it's definitely a, um, something that we need to watch here for, for the coming year. Uh, so today I'm going to be focusing on, you know, the, you know, what blister beetles are basically, um, why, you know, they, they can be an issue, and we'll talk about what factors um, can play into, you know, what we might expect here in the, the coming year. And then we'll also talk a little bit about some management that we can do um, to try to minimize the, minimize the impact um, of these beetles. So starting off, what are blister beetles? So you can see in this photo here, uh, this is your you know, textbook blister beetle. This is one of the ash gray ones. Um, this species is probably the most common uh, that we have here in South Dakota. We saw a lot of these showing up last year. Um, and just kind of some you know, general info on these. They're about you know, a half to an inch long, depending on the species. And I'll go into a little more detail on, on the common species that, we'll, um, that we can see throughout the summer. Um, but in general, about a half to an inch long and the color can vary, again, based on species. So this is the ash gray. There's um, ones that can be black or striped, um, kind of a, a different varieties. But uh, again, we'll cover those here in a little bit. Uh, they can have this velvety appearance. As you can see um, on the ash gray, they have all these really tiny hairs covering their body and it kind of just makes them look velvety. They, some, sometimes they can have a little bit more of a shinier appearance, uh, the black ones especially, um, but overall both of them are gonna have um, that velvety look to them. So the, the you know, main uh, characteristics here that we can use to you know, differentiate these blister beetles from other uh, beetles that might be present in the field uh, is that for one thing, the thorax, you can see where that red arrow is pointing, is going to be narrower uh, than the head and the abdomen. So that's kind of unique to this, this type of insect here is you, you kind of have the, the bigger head and the bigger um, abdomen and then that, that narrow waist. And then the other thing is that they do have this kind of bulbous abdomen and that's gonna stick out uh, out the back kind of underneath of the, the elytra. So that elytra, those are the hard wing coverings and you can see that abdomen kind of sticking out the back. So the adult beetles here, they're, they're herbivores, um, the adults anyway, they feed on pollen, flowers and leaves. They're very attracted to um, any flowering plants. So that's when it kind of, you know, becomes an issue in alfalfa. If it's, you know, a field that's at peak bloom, uh, that's just going to be a magnet for these, these beetles. They're just going to be swarming in there um, and hanging out on the flowers. And they'll eat flowers too. They'll just kind of eat whatever they can find on the plant there. Um, 
Now on the flip side, the larvae are actually predators. Uh, and you don't usually see those, I mean, rarely if ever because they're active below ground. And the other thing is that there's only one generation of blister beetles um, each year. And, you know, I have people contact me and they're like, well, you know, we're, there, there's got to be multiple generations because we're just, they're just kind of change color and we see, um, you know, different ones showing up throughout the year. Well, it's because it, they're, they're different species. So, um, and we'll talk about that when we get into the species that you might have, you know, one color showing up first and then, you know, a different color that they kind of change throughout the season. Um, but each one of those species is just going to have the one generation. So talking about the life cycle, um, just briefly, they're going to, um, they'll overwinter as kind of a pseudo pupa, and then they will actually finish pupation in the spring. And then the adult beetles will emerge anywhere, you know, from probably late June uh, through the month of July. And I would almost kind of extend this into early August because um, there are, you know, a couple species that might be a little more late bloomers, if you will. Um, so these, these adults are then going to be laying their eggs in late summer and early fall. Uh, so right, you know, right about before or during the time when the grasshoppers are going to be laying their eggs, because that is going to be the main food source there of the larva. They're going to be hatching out and then they're going to be feeding on those grasshopper eggs as the grasshoppers are laying them um, through the fall. So you think, okay, well, you know, if they're feeding on grasshopper eggs, that's good, right? They're a beneficial insect. Well, they're beneficial in that respect, um, but there is kind of a drawback with them here. So why are they an issue? Well, the main issue is that the the blister beetles contain a chemical uh, called cantharidin. And this chemical it can cause uh, blistering when it comes in contact with your skin. And you can see that here in this picture. Um, this is actually one of my, my coworkers here. He got, I think one of the blister beetles crawled on his wrist and then I don't know if he smacked it or kind of flicked it off, but it got some of that cantharidin on him and left a, a blister there on his, on his wrist. Um, so that, that cantharidin, it's a defense chemical. They release it through something called reactive or reflex bleeding. And it's just used to, you know, ward off potential predators. You know, something goes to attack them and they get this nasty chemical on them. And for the most part, you know, any predators would just leave them alone. So the other thing too I want to mention is if you come across one of these beetles, don't um, you know don't pick it up with your bare hands. Uh, wear gloves because again you don't want to get any of these blisters on you. It can be kind of painful. So why are they an issue? Again, so the, continuing with this, the the cantharidin it's it's also released if the beetles are crushed. So um, with that, you know, if, if it, they get on, um, on alfalfa or hay when, they're, uh, when an animal is ingesting that, they're going to be chewing it up and they're going to be crushing these beetles. So that chemical will then be released. And if they're, you know, you have contaminated alfalfa that you're feeding to livestock, um, it can cause some, some health issues or it can be fatal in some cases. Uh, horses are the most sensitive uh, to cantharidin. That's really the main one that we're focused on. Uh, when it comes to like cattle and sheep, um, you know, cattle are a lot more, you know, resilient to this, that um, it would take a lot of beetles for, you know, to make them sick. Uh, but, you know, it might even kind of cause some issues when, you know, if they have a stomach ache and they don't want to eat. So that can cause some kind of secondary issues. Um, I'm not really sure on, on, sheep. Uh, I know, you know, I grew up on a farm. We had, we had sheep and I know sheep are kind of picky eaters that they get something weird tasting in their mouth. They'll, they'll spit it out. Um, so, you know, it might not be so much of an issue for sheep. Haven't heard a lot about that, but the big thing is, is horses. 
Okay, so let's talk a little bit about their toxicity, kind of get some context for this. So uh, I'm, this was uh, some research done out of the University of Minnesota that they looked at um, cantharidin concentrations and, and what would be the kind of the lethal dose um, uh, and kind of targeted for horses. And they estimated it to be about one milligram of cantharidin per 2.2 pounds of body weight. And again, that's for horses. And in general, you can have, you know, anywhere from one to five milligrams of that cantharidin um, per adult beetle. So it's going to vary, again, depending on the species, what that concentration might be. So the, the striped and the ash gray ones that we have here in South Dakota are going to have the highest concentration. The striped, definitely, um, those average about five milligrams per beetle. And the ash gray is quite a bit less, only that, you know, one, one milligram per beetle. And the rest are kind of, you know, at that one or, or below. So then kind of to show what this might look like, you know, how many beetles, uh, you know, a horse would have to ingest before um, it, it could be fatal. So looking at, you know, a 500 pound horse, you have the black blister beetle, which that's kind of like the ash gray that you have about one milligram um, per beetle. Uh, a 500 pound horse would have to consume, you know, 1100 of those beetles before uh, it would be fatal to them. Whereas you look at the striped blister beetle, so the three striped, much higher concentration of cantharidin, they'd only have to consume 80 of those um, for it to be fatal. So a big difference there. And that's why it's really important to know, you know what species are present um, in a field. So we'll go over that quickly here, just the, the different species that we can see, the most common ones. And the list here, we have the ash gray blister beetle, the black, the immaculate, the striped, and then the margin blister beetle. And we'll go over each one of these individually. So first off, I've already talked about this one a little bit, the, the ash gray. Again, that's the most common one. It seems to show up, uh, kind of the first one to show up in the summer. Uh, and that's usually at the end of June uh, this last year. We saw them kind of around the 4th of July. It seemed like there's, uh, I was getting a lot of calls um, about these ash gray beetles. And these ones are kind of on the smaller side. They're only about two fifths to two thirds of an inch long. And they're going to have this ash gray color with kind of um, black highlights on them, if you will. The next one is the black blister beetle. Uh, these similar size, uh, two fifths to two thirds of an inch long. Um, I should mention in general, usually the females are a little bit larger in size and then the males are the ones that are a little bit smaller. Uh, so you can kind of almost uh, figure out the gender of them just based on their, their size comparison. Um, but with these black blister beetles, they're gonna have an entirely, uh, you know, just solid black body. Uh, so this next one here is the immaculate blister beetle. So these are among the larger ones. They're going to be anywhere from a half to an inch long. And these will be either uh, orange or gray in color. Uh, most of the ones that I've seen have been orange. And these ones are, are ones that show up a little bit later. Uh, you can see this one on a, a, I took this photo of it on a sunflower head. And um, you know, that's usually where they're really congregating, you know, sunflowers are in peak bloom. So they're just um, really just going to those plants and they blend in really well. Um, so I don't know how often these will actually get into alfalfa, but they certainly like sunflower. Uh, the next one here, this is again, that, you know, kind of the most toxic one that we have in the state. And this is the striped blister beetle. So a little bit smaller, again, that two fifths to two, th two thirds of an inch long, and they're going to be black and kind of that yellow orange color. And they'll have two triangular markings on the head. And you can kind of see that on the picture. It kind of looks like um, two, two uh, triangles almost kind of you know pointed away from each other. Um, and they'll have a couple black stripes there on the thorax, and then they can have two to three black stripes on the elytra. 
And I should mention here with the striped ones, for the most part, these are going to be more on the, the east side of the state. Honestly, the, the furthest west that I've, I did have a report last year of them in, in Jackson County. Um, I think it was kind of on the eastern edge of that county. So uh, for the most part, they're going to be on the east half of the state, but we, we can have them um, a little bit further west. A lot of the rest of these are pretty much statewide. Uh, the margin one, this is um, kind of a, a unique looking uh, blister beetle here. They kind of have different color forms, but in general, they're going to have that um, black or gray with kind of that, um, you know, lighter gray or almost white margins. And then they're going to have a black and white head. And these are really noted for uh, being a severe defoliator. A lot of times these ones will show up even in your, uh, in your garden and they can defoliate some plants. So uh, they're, they're kind of an issue that way. But um, again, you know, they also contain that cantharidin, which is the main concern. So scouting for blister beetles, we'll talk about this and kind of get into, um, you know, what, what can affect the populations from year to year. And first off, you want to check any alfalfa field, you know, prior to each cutting. You want to know if the beetles are present. And oftentimes you want to check the second and later cuttings because they're going to be at higher risk of having an infestation. However, um, last year, I know it was almost, at least out west, um, people were getting their first cutting out and the ash gray blister beetles showed up you know, right at that first cutting. So really I would just check any cuttings, you know, before you go out there um, and, and cut it, check for those beetles. And then the big thing here is that blister beetles are often more abundant in areas where grasshopper populations were high in the previous year. And this is gonna be critically important here for 2022, given uh, the pretty large, uh, you know, numbers of grasshoppers that we saw in 2021. So, you know, as, as we all know, there was, um, you know, significant drought across South Dakota, very favorable dry conditions are, you know, very favorable for grasshoppers because oftentimes, you know, they'll have, um, if you have moisture, um, there's uh, fungal pathogens that can you know, infect grasshoppers and will kind of keep their numbers a little bit lower, but given the dry conditions, there really wasn't anything um, holding back those populations. So we did see widespread outbreaks uh, throughout South Dakota, uh, especially up in the Northwest corner of the state. And I think that part of that was due to um, the fact that Montana had really, you know, exceptional drought uh, through much of the summer. And with, you know, the kind of lack of food that was there, I think it kind of pushed some of those grasshopper populations, you know, south and east, and it kind of it pushed those numbers into, into South Dakota. So we had quite a bit, quite a bit of issues there in the northwest part of the state. The other thing here that I want to draw attention to is the the frost dates or the first hard freeze, I should say. And that's that 28 degrees. That's the you know temperature that it has to get to to really uh, knock down insect activity. And if you look at this map here from 2021, these were our first uh, hard freeze dates. And for the most part, it was not until you know mid to late October um, in the southeast, it was more into November before we had, um, you know, that hard freeze. So that means that there was a long growing season and a, a, a long, longer amount of time for grasshoppers to lay eggs. So that's kind of an issue here moving forward, because if you have a lot of eggs, uh, that's the food source for those blister beetles. So an abundant food source means that, you know, and you know, putting on top of that, that we had a pretty good number of blister beetles last year, I think that combination, um, we really could be set up for seeing some pretty large numbers of blister beetles here in 2022. Uh, this was a photo that I got um, from a guy up 
Um, I think he was in Butte or Meade County. It was just a pasture where, you know, it was drought stricken and there was bare patches of soil. And you had just wherever there were these bare patches of ground, it was just covered with grasshoppers. Um, these are just a swarm of, of bandwing grasshoppers that are laying eggs. So that's probably going to be a hot spot for blister beetles um, this next year or this coming year, I should say. Um, so continuing on our discussion of scouting. So you really want to do those visual observations to see if blister beetles are present. Sweep nets are really useful because even if you can't, you know, see what's there, you got to you can run a sweep net through the field and and collect some things that you wouldn't otherwise see uh, normally just by looking at a plant. Uh, there are no established thresholds for blister beetles. It's more of a presence or absence type of a thing. The big deal is that you want to know what species are present. So collecting the blister beetles and looking at them, you know, do I have ash gray? Do I have striped? Do I have both? Um, and that kind of thing. And the other deal is that you want to check different areas of the field. So um, I, I know that there, there's kind of an edge effect that can occur with these blister beetles because they're you know, if you have that um, alfalfa starting to bloom, um, they'll just be coming into the field and starting at the edges and working their way in. So it might be something where you might have a lot of blister beetles on the edges, but towards the middle of the field, it might not be so bad. So for management, the first thing you want to do just as a preventative thing is to try to harvest the alfalfa prior to peak bloom because those blooms are when, that's what's really gonna draw the beetles into the field. If you do have an infested field, um, first thing you don't wanna cut the hay um, with a conditioner, cause that's going to you know, crush the, the beetles as it's you know, kind of processing that hay. And that can end up you know, releasing the cantharidin and it will coat the hay and it can actually absorb into it. And really, that's something that you want to avoid. You don't want that, that chemical to be, um, it, it can still be toxic if it's, you know, absorbed uh, onto the plant themselves. So the other thing is that, you know, you want to make sure that after you cut the hay, let it dry fully before you rake it up. We had, you know, uh, some really infested fields this last year, but, you know, going out there and after you cut it, and just kind of monitoring those windrows. The beetles, they can fly. They will uh, vacate those plants if you give them time. And that's really ideally what you want to happen. Um, it's really gonna reduce the numbers of them. And just kind of monitor it, you know, let a lot of them leave the, the hay and then, um, and then you can go out there and rake it in bale. And, and what the other thing that ties into this, you know, a lot of folks, were you know asking me last year like okay well what do I spray to kill these things and that's the the last thing that you want to do you don't want to spray an insecticide um, on those infested fields because you're going to actually be killing the beetles and you'll increase the number of beetles that would be present per bale because they won't be able they won't be alive to vacate the plants they'll just remain dead on the plants um, and then you'll just end up bailing them up so definitely something you want to avoid. So some considerations for buying and selling hay. Uh, you know, you definitely want to notify a buyer um, if, you know, if, they, if you have infested bales. Uh, the other thing, you know, it might be okay for feeding those to, uh, to cattle, but, you know, especially if they're going to, to horses, you know, make sure you kind of know what they're going to be used for. Uh, and then you want to use, if possible, the first cutting for horses. That is, if the blister beetles haven't shown up by then, um, because in general, that's going to usually have fewer beetles as long as you get that first cutting out before they show up um, in, during the summer. And the other thing you want to avoid feeding hay from the field edges, because again, like I mentioned, there's kind of an edge effect with these beetles, um, that that's where they're going to be. Um, most abundant there on the edges. So just to summarize quickly, um, you know, blister beetles, I think, you know, in my mind, they're probably going to be pretty abundant here in 2022. 
Um, given the abundant food source of those grasshoppers having plenty of time to lay lots of eggs and the high numbers of beetles that we had last year, kind of that combination, we're probably going to see quite a few of them um, this year. And the other thing to mention with that is wherever you saw, you know, grasshopper outbreaks last year, there, you know, those blister beetles will mirror those populations the following year. So wherever there were grasshopper outbreaks last year, probably going to have a lot of blister beetles this year. Um, so again, you know, you want to scout the fields prior to cutting, know what species are present. Again, keep in mind that that's striped um, and the ash gray there, the more toxic ones, especially the striped beetles. Um, and you want to avoid conditioning infested hay and allow it to dry fully before you rake it or bale it. Again, also don't treat with an insecticide. And, you know, be careful when you're buying and selling infested hay. Um, you know, make sure that's not going to horses. You don't want to be liable um, for, you know, killing someone's horse uh, if you're giving them infested hay. So that's all I have for you today. Um, here's my contact information. And, you know, please feel free to uh, give me a call or email me if you, you know, run into any issues with blister beetles um, this coming year. I'd really like to know uh, kind of where they're showing up throughout the state. So thank you for your time. All right. Thank you, Patrick. Um, if you want to stop sharing your screen, I'll go ahead and throw up that CCA credit. And then it looks like you did have a question. Um, is there anything to worry about if the blister beetles are in sunflower and will they harm the crop? Uh, not that I know of. You know, I don't think we've really had any issues with them. Um, they, they don't seem to go through the harvester. And I, I don't think, you know, that, that that's something to be concerned about. Because by the time you're actually combining sunflower, they've dried you know, they've dried down um, and those blister beetles will have moved off by then. So it's not really something to worry about in sunflowers. Good question though. And let's see if there's any other questions. Well, if not, um, I appreciate both you, Patrick and Sarah for talking today. Um, Looks like there is one more poll up. We can answer that. Just a couple of questions. Um, but yeah, we hope to see you tomorrow when we will be discussing pulse crops.